Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we all stand today. I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, so I'd like to acknowledge them as traditional owners and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Thank you all for joining our sixth What If webinar today. My name's Angela Nolan. I'm the Policy and Communications Manager here at Vimiac. For those of you who haven't uh, been to one of these seminars before, the idea behind our weekly What If webinars was born out of the need to focus on what the mental health system would look like if we were working well and a more positive focus. We've had and we'll continue to have guest speakers each week discussing a myriad of topics within the mental health space. Today, we're honored to have Jay Shri Kulkarni discussing what if women's mental health was a priority in Victoria? Professor Kulkarni directs a large psychiatric research group called the Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Centre, which is dedicated to discovering new treatments, new understanding, and new services for people with a range of mental illnesses. She became a fellow of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Psychiatrists in 1989 and was awarded a PhD from Monash University in 1997 for her thesis, Women and Psychosis. She is internationally acknowledged as a leader in the field of reproductive hormones and their impact on mental health. Professor Kulkarni was elected the president of the International Association of Women's Mental Health in 2017. Um, but before we start the talk, uh, Emily will go over the process and a few guidelines for today's webinar. So I'll pass over to Em. Thanks, Angela. Um, so most of you might know because you've been to them before, but the talk will be about 35, 40 minutes, maybe 45. Um, after that, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes where you can ask any questions relating to the topic. Uh, because of the amount of people on uh, the call on the webinar, instead of calling your questions out, if you can just type them in the chat system, um, you'll see the chat button at the bottom of the screen. So if you can just type in there what your questions are, I can then relay them to Joshree. Uh, we might not have enough time to get through everyone's, depending on how many questions there are, but we can take these offline um, and we'll share the responses with you via email. Um, if you can also just make sure that you're on mute for the entire webinar, that'd be great. And I just want to flag again that the webinar is recorded uh, to go onto our website. So if you don't want your face featured, please do turn your uh, cameras off. Okay, and let, I will now pass over to Jayashree. Well, thank you very much, and uh, particularly thanks to Trish, Trisha, um, who uh, invited, well, I, I don't know who invited me, but certainly I've been working with Trisha uh, in the area of women's mental health, so it's a very common shared interest, and uh, I thought that um, trying to imagine what our system would look like if women's mental health was a priority is a really exciting prospect, and one that I actually hope is not just theoretical in the long run. Um, so mental health policy in Australia does not consider women's mental health across the life course. This is a statement that was made by Maria Duggan after a lot of research um, that a group of us had, had done looking at the investment in women's mental health currently in Australia. And we came to this conclusion that it really does not uh, rate very well and is not funded very well. And I can um, show you the, the work that was done. Subsequently, um, there's been a national women's health strategy that's not mental health, but health strategy that was recently launched. And that's supposed to be a 10 year strategy that takes women's health from 2020 to 2030. And it was launched in Canberra just last year. And in that, the area of women's mental health is priority number four. So it is in there, but it's priority number four. And the five key foci that make up that priority number four is about enhancing um, health education for women, mental health education, awareness and primary prevention, focusing on early intervention, diagnosis and access to mental health care, investing in service delivery for priority populations, adopting a multifaceted approach to support women and girls with eating disorders, and raising the awareness and embedding practices to reduce stigma and discrimination associated with mental ill health. Now, these are all wonderful statements, but if you'll note, 
there's not a lot of actual didactic clarity. They're really good statements and we would all agree with them. But apart from the bit that talks about eating disorders, there's not a mention about really what the action plan and focus would particularly look like. And this is priority number four. So it's not up in the top three. This is the document that Maria Duggan and others um, we put together. It's now old because it's 2016, but it was a very important um, piece of work to look at what happens with women's mental health. How can you strengthen the foundation for women, uh, families and the Australian economy? Clearly the economy is taking a major beating at the moment. But when we look at mental ill health, we find that mental disorders represent the leading cause of disability, the highest burden of non-fatal illnesses for women. This is not going to be a surprise to anybody um, in this audience, but certainly in Australian women, there's a significant proportion of women, 43%, that's uh, you know, quite a high percentage of the Australian female population who've experienced mental ill health at some point in time. We look at the sorts of things that women have experienced and compared to men, you see that the um, figures show that there's twice as many women uh, likely to suffer anxiety. And in fact, in this particular uh, time of COVID with some of the survey work that, that we've done and that others have done. And I think it'd be interesting to see what your survey showed at Vimiac, but certainly that would be more like five times. So that the anxiety levels are much higher uh, and particularly higher in women. Depression is twice as likely uh, in women and um, the post-traumatic stress disorder, which again, part of the second lockdown in COVID is something that's emerging as a real critical issue. The unfortunate part about equality is that women are catching up with alcohol dependence during their lifetimes and certainly there's a much higher proportion of women who experience anorexia and bulimia and the other figure about um, suicide compared to men which is higher in women. The cost of all of this is huge and even without COVID the cost of depression and anxiety in Australian women uh, due to direct lost productivity, that's if somebody is suffering and they cannot go to work, is estimated to be $22 billion a year. That's direct lost productivity. And the indirect costs are things like um, the cost of loss of effective parenting of children, uh, loss of care of the elderly, um, all sorts of other social issues. When you add all those in, that cost becomes much higher. But $22 billion per year based on the Add, uh, the absolute data. So that would be a minimum of what women's mental health costs the country per year. When we look at women and mental ill health, what we find is that usually you can think about the three different areas that actually impact um, together and sometimes independently with different foci creating different problems. So there's social issues, biological issues and psychological issues, and they do all coalesce. So it's not as neat as saying there are just these causes or these ones. So social, for instance, violence against women is still an issue, a big issue in our community and perhaps even worse with uh, the lockdown situations that we saw first time round and probably second time round. The violence, poverty, gender inequities, still we have gender inequities in wage, in wages. So women doing the same job will still not earn as much. Our informal health care workers, for example, um, women earn less and that's one industry. So like that, there's many other industries. And we know that money talks. So if the earning power is less, then there is less power. Social roles also have a part to play and some cultures have a, a, an almost uh, entrenched uh, secondary citizenship for women. The biology is also critical because there are differences and I'll speak a bit more about the hormone impacts and what it would look like if we could actually have a bit more consideration about that in our moving forward to try and help uh, women. There are differences in drug metabolism systems and brain circuitry and genetic transmission, all of which mean that, for example, medication responses can be quite different in women compared to men. And that's often overlooked and not taken into account. The psychology can be very different. And I don't mean to represent all women as the same, clearly not. There are big differences between women as well. But if you took the group 
um, and based a, a, a study of defence mechanisms and how do people cope with different crises, there is a difference between males and females because of psychological responses and defence mechanisms. So what if women's mental health was a priority in Victoria? What would we be thinking about? And I think many things would actually look really different. And I'm not going to be able to talk about all the different things that I would have liked to, spoke to have spoken about. So I brought it down to looking at three things. Inpatient units in our public mental health system, diagnostic categories that might change if um, women's mental health was a priority, and a focused on women-centred biology, such as hormones and mental health. So let's have a think about the design of the, of the inpatient unit set up in Victoria. This is a drum that I've been banging for about three decades, and I'm going to be quite blunt. I don't think that we do anywhere near um, service that women in this state need and deserve when they have to have an admission to an inpatient unit. Um, it's really unfortunate, it's really sad, but again, this is something that I hope will be addressed in, by the Royal Commission into Mental Health, as well as uh, the Royal Commission that was held about violence against women. Because the design and the treatment style and the staffing of our inpatient units in all of our public hospital system would be quite different if we prioritise women's mental health. If we prioritise women's mental health, one of the first things that we would consider is the impact of trauma, early life trauma in particular, and then subsequent traumas. And it's a, it's a whole area that, in, in my view, does not receive anywhere near the priority or attention that it really should. And by that, I mean, go back to what I talked about, the social determinants of mental health. In the social determinants is violence. And violence against women is one of the critical factors that can actually create and cause and perpetuate uh, ill health. So if we think that there's that factor as a critical factor in causing mental ill health, then we need to address it better. We need to address it in a lot, a lot of different ways, but we particularly need to make sure that women who are coming into hospital for treatment or who have to come in hospital for treatment should at the very least have safe and private areas that do not then re-traumatise them in the setting of um, perhaps potentially having to deal with an assault from a co-patient or staff member or verbal assault or be, feel uh, intimidated or feel threatened in any way, shape or form. And at the moment, with the setups that we have in many of our inpatient units, this is a difficulty. This is very difficult to actually um, be able to offer women safe private um, areas. So many people rightly um, went to the Mental Health Complaints Commission over a period of time. Uh, many women themselves who had received treatment and were very um, traumatised and unhappy by that, but also their families. And um, after trying to access um, the mental health services and some of the mental health services were very receptive to the women, but others were not. And so then they went to the Mental Health Complaints Commission and over time, the Mental Health Complaints Commission um, organised a whole bunch of work to be done in the area. They actually asked um, MAPRC, my organisation, to be one of the um, centres that actually undertook specific research in this area, which we did. And specifically, they also set up um, visits and, and uh, investigation of the complaints that the women had made about sexual um, assault, abuse, whatever you want to call it. So that ended up in this document called The Right to be Safe, and I'll talk a bit more about that. But if we look at the design of units, um, I always wonder why is it that we have such, and I'm going to be blunt here, why do we have such ugly-looking places? They're not pretty to look at. I, you know, there's, there's just not a need for an inpatient unit to look bad when we look around the world and we don't even have to go very far because the, this one, number two here, is actually Corinda unit in Queensland. And I, I think it looks very, very much less 
like some kind of uh, horrible institutionalized place. There's some color. Um, there's each place is a single room with an attached bathroom toilet. It has space, it has light, it has pleasant colors, and there are safe women only wings. And this is from um, Toronto, the first one. And you can see that the design there is much more um, uh, home-like and not uh, institutional grey with lots of metal, etc., etc., and certainly um, not a communal bathroom or any of those things where we know that a number of uh, assaults had taken place. So places in Victoria, some are better than others and some are moving towards uh, renovations that are much more in keeping with 21st century, but some are not. So again, this is the sort of thing that is taken up and looked at, um, particularly in this report, which was the Right to be Safe report. This report was launched, that's the executive summary, that, that colour, there's an actual bigger report. It was launched in 2018 and um, the Mental Health Complaints Commissioner launched it and um, the Ombudsman has also been involved and so on. Um, this, was, this was me talking about the call to arms that the MHCC Mental Health Complaints Commission made a special point about. So it's really time for action. And this is the point that Tricia and I have made together at the Victorian um, Women's Mental Health Alliance, which is a division of Women's Health Victoria that we've been lobbying governments and so on, that it's time for considered, concerted and long-lasting action to make sure that units are designed, new mm -hmm. units are designed to be safe, to offer privacy. But more than that, it's not just the capital works and the building, it's about the staffing, it's about having um, a, an attitude of um, respect and privacy and safety mm -hmm that's engendered by the um, quality of care right across our service. So that would be one of the things that, you know, if women's mental health was a priority in Victoria, I think we'd have more um, kind care in much better looking surrounds. So that's, that's one thing that I'm really very keen to see uh, come to fruition. And we, we get closer all the time, but I'm impatient and I really want this change, that change in patient units to happen uh, yesterday. So if we have a look at the second bit, which um, was women and women's mental health and diagnostic categories. Now, here we have one of the issues in that diagnoses in psychiatry are made according to subjective assessments, pattern recognition of the symptoms and the experience of the clinician. It's very different to how diagnoses are made in other parts of medicine. If you have chest pain, you would go to your doctor, explain that you've got chest pain, and then you would get a diagnostic test, usually an ECG as a start, so an electrocardiogram, but then other tests done as well. And then on that ECG or other tests would be the definitive objective diagnosis. Aha, uh -huh, you have um, ischemic heart disease. This is a chest pain that we need to worry about. Let's get on and do something about it and we'll do this, this and this. So it's all quite objective. Unfortunately, it's not like that in making diagnoses in psychiatry. It's, it's, a, it's much more subjective, although there are criteria for diagnoses and that's what the DSM is about and the newer system, well not newer, but a different system called the ICD-11 which is the one that the World Health Organization uses. They don't use the DSM, which is an American system. So we have this issue inherent in psychiatry that the diagnoses are subjective. The other thing that is often um, left out of consideration, I hark back to that, is trauma. So the difficulty that we face many times is people come in, say, to the emergency department, women come into the emergency department or they come in um, to acute psychiatry places, either community, acute community treatments or acute inpatient treatments. And often there's a sense that the trauma questions are not really asked. They may be vaguely alluded to, but they're not really asked in a great lot of detail. And that's really unfortunate because then a diagnosis can be made that doesn't take the traumatic part of this woman's early life and subsequent traumas into account. 
personality disorders as a diagnostic group are very subjective because what you're actually saying here is that someone's personality is getting them into difficulties maintaining work or maintaining love, maintaining a relationship that means something to that person. It is a very subjective diagnosis, personality disorders. This is a quote from a person diagnosed with BPD, a woman. She said, I hate the term personality disorder. It means that the very core of who you are is disordered because it doesn't fit into what somebody else has decided is the norm. Almost anyone can fit the criteria for a personality disorder, but that doesn't mean they're sick. And the, the more and more I've been involved in um, mental health as a clinician, the more I agree with this because, you know, it's, it's quite variable how people cope with different things. And just because people cope differently does not necessarily mean that it's a personality disorder. And particularly somebody who is diagnosed with borderline personality disorder um, has a real issue with this particular um, diagnostic term, as I do. I have a real problem with this diagnostic term. I don't like it one bit. So I believe that if women's mental health was a priority, then the role of trauma in the development of borderline personality disorder would receive much greater attention because of this relationship of trauma to what is eventually diagnosed, particularly in women, um, borderline personality disorder. When we look at people who have received this diagnosis, what we find in our work is that a higher prevalence of trauma in early life exists. It can be severe chronic trauma amongst adult women when they look back on their life. And um, in my clinic in particular, that we have a number of women who um, tell us about uh, all sorts of things that are really, really awful and horrible that happened to them when they were children and happened when they were ad adolescents and, and then continue to have ripples into their adult life. And if a child has trauma in their early life, there are subsequent difficulties in attachments, making good relationships, making good connections, having trust um, down the track. So I think when clinicians don't ask enough about all of this, they can get on the wrong tram and, and then have this diagnosis that can actually lead to further stigmatisation and further problems. So... When I talk about trauma, though, I'm not just talking about sexual abuse. I'm talking about emotional trauma, physical trauma, and sexual trauma. So they're all very different, and there can be all of them. But the end result is that somebody experiences through adulthood a whole range of symptoms that has to do with having regulation of their emotions, having concentration, having a sense of self-esteem, having a sense of purpose, and carrying through a quality of life that means something to her. So um, is there an overlap between uh, complex PTSD, which is another term that's been um, discussed, and which is a form of post-traumatic stress disorder and BPD? And I would say resoundingly, yes. This is a diagnosis. Complex PTSD is a part of another classification system, the ICD, International Classification of Diseases Number 11, which is the World Health Organization classification system. It's used in Europe, it's used in the UK, but it's not used in America and it's not used here. And we use the DSM, which doesn't have complex PTSD as part of it. So there's a lot of debates going on at the moment with People saying, yes, there is BPD. People saying there isn't BPD. This is about uh, trauma. We need to rethink what, the, what is going on here. So just in terms of um, some, some descriptors, so we have the big circle of PTSD. People know about that, particularly in combat war veterans and other scenarios where there's post-traumatic stress disorder. We have this other thing that is described as a personality disorder, but in the intersecting bit is complex PTSD, which takes a lot of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, but the actual trauma is not just one thing that happened, like for the war veteran, where the grenade went off on manoeuvres, and you can say that's what the trauma is. This is the quieter, more chronic 
traumas uh, in an ongoing way, like domestic or other violence. Then people say, but not everyone with BPD has trauma. And again, I would say, hang on, let's define this as, as it needs to be, because there are many things that are traumatic and different people experience trauma or different things differently. So what may be very traumatic for some people may not be so traumatic for others. But certainly it's important to get an idea of what went on in early life for women and for men, but it does have an, a, an impact on brain development and some of the circuits and brain circuitry and chemistry that happens in the brain. So again, there are difficulties that we have with the history of trauma not asked about in depth by clinicians, but sometimes the person with the um, condition doesn't want to share that information because she feels shame or loyalty um, to whoever the abusers were and has deeply held fears. However, the number of women who are diagnosed with BPD as a personality disorder have significant trauma and that number is very high. Why do I go on about this diagnosis? Because the stigma attached to this diagnosis is high. So, it's, it's bad enough that people are struggling with whatever the symptoms are, but then they have to also cope with stigma, which is not fair. So that's why the term is important to rethink because many people who come along, and particularly women are more diagnosed with this than men, um, come along to emergency department with deliberate self-harm, can actually end up feeling blamed or feeling stigmatised or worse, that there's just no help in sight. So that's why when we say what's in the name, there's a lot that's in the name. It's really important what words we use. Um, it is important that we re recognise the woman who has, and the man who has been uh, diagnosed with this as a survivor of abuse in many cases, that in fact this person has defeated the awful adversity and so they're a bit of a they're not a bit they're, they're quite a hero and they're actually amazing in the fact that they've managed to overcome what was going on in their early life so in in a lot of ways we need to actually applaud the individual not to stigmatize and yet in our current systems the stigma is is quite prevalent so again if we could turn around the priority I think it would be another issue to think about the success story that this particular individual is, that, that they've survived what happened in early life. This is another actual quote. Borderline makes me feel like I don't really have something and that's how I often feel, unreal. And that's a common symptom. People talk about the fact that they don't feel real and so the term borderline is, is again, invalidating. And then this comment, um, typical psychiatrists can't make up their mind, so they call it borderline. So there are many uh, comments, of course, from people who have been diagnosed with this that, again, I think highlight the need to rethink what's going on and to think about the name. So for women, it may be better to adopt a trauma framework. And that's important, too, because if you start to think about the trauma framework, you've got different solutions and different options to actually understand and to work with the individual. So you think about the sorts of things that can be offered somebody who um, you know, has PTSD. And so there's a lot of good trauma work that has been done over the years. And there are available trauma type frameworks that people could utilize. Um, what then emerges if we change the name is new understanding and possibly then new treatment approaches. And that's what we're working on at the moment. I'm not happy with the biological treatments that are available for people with this condition because they're often just given every single drug under the sun, uh, as in the psychiatric drug. And there are lots and lots of side effects, particularly obesity, a whole range of side effects, without really helping the symptomatology that this person is struggling with in order to develop her, her world so that she can then go on to have work or um, a relationship that she finds meaningful. And um, unfortunately, the psychological treatments that are effective are out there, such things as DBT, dialectical behavioural treatments, but some of the other therapies that are around and that are, are um, 
are available are only available in the private sector or only available with a private psychologist who can offer the treatments. And that's a difficulty because a number of the, particularly the women with severe um, condition, um, end up in the public sector where there's not a lot of the psychological therapies available. So um, we're taking a different approach on this whole area by looking at the cognition. So the thinking aspects, the thinking disturbances have often been viewed as secondary to the hallmark symptoms of emotional instability and impulsivity. If we turn that around and actually think that it's, it's the cognitive difficulties that underpin the symptoms of the disorder, then we can actually move forward to look at how are we going to improve, help or clarify the cognition processes. And I'm not going to go to too much, but we've been looking at new pathways, new chemistry, in particular the glutamate and the NMDA system are systems that are activated that are really important in integrating your environment with your thinking. And that's what neuroplasticity, experience dependent neuroplasticity. Using all of this, I put together a concept about complex trauma, complex PTSD or borderline personality disorder as the old terminology is that here we have a child who has stress in their early life. So they have cortisol and other hormones that are accentuated in early life. And these hormones are potent in the brain. They're not just in the body. But they do have an effect on the body as well. And that leads to other hormone disturbances. So in our women, we see a whole bunch of things like polycystic ovarian syndrome. We see PMDD, which is premenstrual depression. We see menopausal relapse. And we see high levels of anxiety because of the cortisol axis hormones here, low thresholds for re trauma. So these are the hormone disturbances. We also see disturbances in this neurochemical, glutamate, which is different to the chemicals of serotonin and dopamine, which is where most of the psychiatric drugs work. Both the antidepressants and the antipsychotics work on serotonin, you know, SSRIs, for example, SNRIs. So these drugs or this system is a different system and those drugs don't work particularly brilliantly on this system. The other thing that's important um, to think about is it's a whole body uh, experience, bad experience when people, children have uh, stress in an ongoing way in early life or even somebody has ongoing stress. You know, the body reacts as well as the brain and the immune system also can um, take uh, some stress itself and the immune system is not just how well you can fight off COVID although that's part of it but it's also how well uh, or how do you metabolize medications that's determined by the immune system this is why many times we see in women in particular who are given medications that they have bad side effects to medications even given in low doses sometimes and again it's something that's important to consider because if, if you get the wrong dose, you will get the side effects and not the, the required or wanted effects. And often the whole thing ends up as being another problem. So that's a brief description of the sorts of things when you start thinking differently, you move away from a concept of personality disorder, which is stigmatizing and which people go, well, you're stuffed. You know, that's your personality. It's disordered. Nothing I can do. That's not good. That is not appropriate. And so when we think about taking a better story, look harder, think again, we do find that we can actually approach things differently with new concepts. And in particular, we've got to be careful of the physical health alongside mental health. It's not good enough to go, yep, well, there's no more voices. But look, look what's happened. There's a whole bunch of side effects, including huge weight gain. You haven't gained um, anything and the person is now struggling with her weight or um, with consequences of weight gain such as diabetes or high blood pressure or all sorts of things as well as feeling bad about looking uh, a certain way so we need to take a holistic view in this condition particularly because it lends itself to new doors being opened if we think differently so um this is some of the work we've been doing. It's some of it's published ads out there. Um, but I would urge clinicians, and if we could focus on women, in particular, 
I think new thinking with women's mental health is really required as a priority right now. So in the last bit, I wanted to talk about the hormone impact on women's mental health. And if women's mental health was a priority, we'd have a different view about why some conditions are actually emerging for the women in terms of mental ill health. So hormones have a really critical impact on the brain. And for a long, long time, this was ignored because people went, well, you know, reproductive hormones like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, they're all about having babies and that's it. But it's not. It's, they're very, very potent brain hormones. And so these hormones, yes, they do have a role to play in reproduction, but they also have a significant role in modulating the brain chemistry that is particularly behind such things as emotions and thinking and uh, perception and long planning in terms of thinking and a number of other different things, memory, for example, and new learning. So as we've got better in neuroscience, understanding the interplay between estrogens, progesterones, androgens, that's testosterone, and the brain, a lot of other things have become a little bit clearer in terms of some of the things that women experience that were not particularly well understood before, but we've got a long way to go to get that out into general knowledge. There are some specific depressions that are related to reproduction. So PMDD or PMS, they do different things, but they're along the same spectrum. So PMDD is premenstrual depression, dysphoric disorder, depression. PMS is premenstrual syndrome. So PMS is kind of like the, the, the easy end of the spectrum where many women, it's not easy, but where many women experience uh, physical symptoms and a bit of uh, irritability right through to PMDD, which is a very significant, severe, life-threatening depression that occurs cyclically and occurs uh, once a month in the women who have um, menstrual cycles, so their reproductive age. There's a whole other area that we've been working on about um, the effects of the oral contraceptive pill. And at the moment, I am sad to say, we don't have a lot of pills on the market that do not cause depression. Most of them do cause depression. And this depression is worsened in vulnerable women who have got a story of um, early life trauma or other things that are going on in their environment. So this is like another factor um, that adds to the, the, the bundle of concerns and uh, leading to problems with depression. Postnatal depression, we, we know about, but this is another area where there are some new developments looking at um, better treatments for postnatal depression with using hormonal strategies. Um, it seems to be common sense that, it, you know, if it happens only in the time when the hormones have gone haywire post-delivery, then surely it would make sense to have a look at a hormonal strategy, but that hasn't been the case. And again, the other thing is perimenopausal. So perimenopausal being around the menopause, that there is a significant depression. And it's not a simple, um, she's just a bit grumpy type phenomenon. This is a significant depression that actually has a suicidality associated with it. I'm going to touch briefly on all of these, but I probably won't have time to get through too much because we're nearly at the end of our time. But as I said, PMDD, premenstrual depression, has a cyclical onset and a cyclical offset. So often the, the critical thing that women tell me in my clinic is, I was okay, okay, and then bang, I suddenly felt you know, terrible. I couldn't get out of bed, I couldn't think, I was really foggy in the brain, I just couldn't stop crying, um, and so on. Um, and then so usually the classical is with bleeding um, that suddenly she feels better. However, it doesn't have to necessarily follow the cycle in that same way. For severe PMDD, the vitamins and herbal treatments don't really work. The best treatments are to use the oral contraceptive pill if the person is safe to use that. And Zoli is really the only pill on the market at the moment that doesn't create more depression. It's sad, but the common pills, Levlin and, and Nordet and so on, um, have a progesterone in it that is not particularly conducive to good mental health. I often say this because I need women to hear this, that PMDD is a brain hormone condition 
it's not fixed by total hysterectomy and getting the ovaries out because many women say, I can't stand it one, one day longer. I just want to go in and get everything removed. That will not fix the problem. And we've seen some really horrible situations where 23-year-olds have had hysterectomies and ovarectomies and um, then she you know, decides later that she wanted to have a baby. So it's, it's really important that we understand this condition better and often the women have got the answers. And that's the other thing to put forward is we talk about women's mental health being a priority, but actually just listening to the women's stories and their solutions, it's incredible how intuitive and how well a number of women who've come to the clinic have understood their problem, but they just haven't had the reception to be able to get on with it because they know what they want and what they need. The pill. There are many, many pills that are out there on the market that are really horrible in terms of uh, a hormone-induced depression. So the progesterone-only pills are really bad because they don't have estrogen. Estrogen is the good hormone if we want to keep it basic. It's a very protective hormone in the brain. Progesterone can cause depression. So in the pills or the, that's the mini pill, or the Implanon, which can be the straw that's under the skin, or the Mirena IUD. These are all contraceptives that are progesterone only, and we've seen depression escalate in those women who are sensitive to their hormones. Not everybody is sensitive. Many women have these contraceptions and don't have the problem, but it is important that um, if there's a sensitivity that that's taken into consideration as a factor that needs dealing with before getting into a whole bunch of antidepressant treatment and other things. And I, I talked about we only have one mood neutral pill that's available and that's the Zoli. Perimenopausal depression is under-recognised and underrated. So again, if women's mental health was a priority, we'd spend a lot more time with our middle-aged women ensuring that they could understand what's going on in their brain and what is going on for them in their body and what therefore is a solution to help with this particular form of depression. And let's not um, underestimate this anymore because the depression rates go up. This is ABS data, uh, you know, Bureau of Statistics data, 16 times in the 42 to 52-year-old woman, women as a collective group. This group has the second highest completed suicide in Australia. So this is not a minor problem. And unfortunately, there's been too much of a tendency to go, yeah, yeah, well, you know, it's one of those things and we'll just keep going with she'll get over it, she'll get over it. But many times we see terrible situations where it could be the very first time that somebody experiences depression or it could be that she's had depression in the past and done very well, but now it's relapse. And this relapse doesn't respond well to standard antidepressant treatment um, and nor does it respond well to psychotherapies or lifestyle. These are the symptoms that many women with this particular form of depression experience. And you see their plummeting self-esteem and a number of other symptoms that can be really horrible and really make it difficult for uh, a middle-aged woman. And it does start before the hot flushes and before the actual body symptoms. So that's the difficulty in making this diagnosis. It might have to be retrospective because often the, the major age at which women do describe a change in mental state because of this is around 43, 44 or 45, whereas the hot flushes and the, the scanty periods and changing periods might not happen until they're 50. That's the average. So we have to be better at understanding what's going on hormonally in the brain before we even know what the impact is in the body. A subset of women seem to be predisposed to experience these particularly severe mood disturbances. It's a subset of women, not all women. I'm not trying to medicalise menopause, but I'm just saying that if there are women who really are struggling and suffering with this, then we need to do something better for them because the standard treatments are not working for this particular group. And nor can you pick it up with hormone um, tests because the hormone tests are testing what's going on in the peripheral system. So you take a sample of blood from the arm, but that's not going to tell you what's going on with the hormones in the brain. And that's where the actual disturbances are occurring. So we can't do this with uh, 
a usual test. Depression, of course, is multifactorial. And of course, many women are going through horrible relationship breakdowns or difficulties at, at work or uh, difficulties coping with being a carer or difficulties with dealing with their children and so on and so on. It is many, many factors. But it, what I find is that this is often the situation that a woman has got these multifactors, but she's kind of coping okay with it all. Like she's learned by the time she's in her mid forties, a lot of skills and um, is quite competent at dealing with a lot of different things, but it's like she suddenly gets whacked with this new factor that everybody's scratching their heads as to what, what's going on, what's new, what's happened here. And the answer is not in the relationships and the stresses of work and all those other things, because she's dealt with that before. This is something new. And often this is the sleeper. This is the thing that many people do not consider. And so we, we're trying to get this message out there that general practitioners, um, gynecologists, uh, think about this in the depressed woman who's presenting with maybe a past depression, but she's got that under control, or maybe a first time ever depression and you can't work out what's going on because there are different solutions. And the different solutions are to do such things as um, our research is saying, you know, we can recognise the condition. We use different sorts of safer, shorter uh, hormone treatments. There are brain oestrogens that we use that are just affecting in the brain, not in the rest of the body, and they're called selective oestrogen receptor modulators. Um, and there are, sorry, there are a variety of other things that work too. Physical health overviews, tackling the weight gain, watching the red wine consumption, the lack of exercise, and working with natural medicines as well. So we do all of these different things in looking at perimenopausal depression. We have more work to do. We've got lots of different projects that are going on for women. And again, one of the issues with not having a priority of women's mental health is that the funding isn't there too. So I'm not going to start whinging to you about the difficulties of getting funding for this research, but I can tell you that um, it is nowhere near funded the level of some of the areas of a mental health research. And that's a problem because it cuts away from a significant proportion of the population who are really struggling. So women's mental health, where to from here? I think we'd like to emphasize that one size does not fit all. We need specific mental health approaches for women. We need them urgently. And that we all need to get together to be able to make women's mental health a real priority now. And it's not good that for the next 10 years, it's priority number four. And even in the priority number four of the women's health strategy, the national strategy, it's not really um, didactic enough or have enough concrete details in there. So thank you for letting me talk about a subject that's very dear to my heart. Um, and I'd really like to take some questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was extremely informative and very inspiring. Um, really appreciate you taking us through all of this. Um, if you're happy as well, Jashri, um, to have your slides up on our website. Sure. Yeah. So if anyone wants to go back, because there's quite a lot of information there. So if anybody wants to go back or wants to share anything, um, it will be on our website. Um, so a few questions have come through. Uh, firstly, why is the DSM-5 still favoured over the ICD-11 in Australia? It's the American dominance. We were, were very, um, it was almost like, you know, having been a, you know, a, a colony of Britain back in the day and then we broke free of that and then we became a colony of America in a lot of ways. And for some reason that is still in existence. And um, we try to influence the DSM-5 with saying, hey, what about this group of, of people? You know, like, don't call it a personality disorder. Have a look at what's going on. But there was no, no go because the American war veterans lobby is a very powerful lobby. So they kept saying we don't want the PTSD category to include women with early life traumas in that category. So it was a political football that went on. So I think the answer is, yeah, we're not really um, free of the major American influence. Thank you. Um, another question, what can the average female consumer do right now to make this a priority? 
Look, I think, um, and again, uh, I noticed Sue Armstrong um, there. So again, um, you know, we've got some very um, amazing uh, female consumers and Sue is somebody, Sue Armstrong is somebody that I've, I've continued to work with on the women's only ward issue. So that's where the voice for the consumers has been particularly, I think, good. We need more. But that's a priority area and particularly in people coming forward to both of the Royal Commissions. The first one was the violence against women um, and the second one being um, the current one, which is the, the women, the, sorry, the Mental Health uh, Royal Commission. I think it's really critical to get the female voice heard there and um, that's one area. The second area is um, to mobilise through things such as the Women's Mental Health Alliance, which is a subdivision of the government. And, and again, to get political, you've got Vimiac, who's a great organisation, um, but to not lose the women's voice in that, because sometimes what happens is, um, and again, my bias, but, you know, I'll, I, I get annoyed when people talk about youth mental health and the focus is on young men. So it's not young men that are, the, that are having the problems. There's a lot of uh, young women who are struggling with different things to what the young men are. But it's almost as if the female voice is, is, is not as well heard because it's not as loud. So I'd say you know, people like Sue Armstrong and others have been very good at getting publicity for the issue. And I think we're closer than we've ever been before to getting the ward stuff improved. And I, have, I still haven't given up hope about it. I've been going on about it for as long as Sue has for decades, but you know, we, we don't give up. So please make noise. And use your organisations like Vimiac and others. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, another question come through um, saying that this person is a complex trauma survivor uh, and has PMDD. Yep. When they've called... Common combination. Uh, when they've called the CAT team or presented at a women's hospital emergency department, uh, they've been denied access to the treatment. Yep. Um, how can services get away with that? How can they get away with treating us like it's not real um, and that they don't have to offer any other type of service? Yeah. So again, you gave me my dream topic. If I was running the thing and we had the priority for women's mental health, that would be something that we'd want to educate people on. Yes, it is still considered to be slightly unreal, slightly made up, all of these things that, you know, I spend a lot of my time trying to educate my colleagues to say, this is really real, this is really serious, you need to treat it differently because it's not going to respond to standard treatments. Um, so we need to understand it better. So the hormone links that I, taught, I showed you on that diagram are our hypothesis and explanation. Uh, about why these are linked. Why is early life trauma linked with something like a premenstrual depression? And there's a clear neuroscience link. People get it in the research world, but we have to get that out there into the clinical world and we have to get over the bias that women are somehow unreliable in their stories, they're just making it up, they're manipulative or trying to get attention. It's all just junk. And so we're trying very hard to de-junk it. And you guys are the a really good group of the act to help demystify a lot of this and get the information out there. And also engaging media, general media, I think is important in this. I can write papers, and I do, till the cows come home in the <laughs> psychiatric journals, which I have to as part of my job. But it's really only when I talk to somebody at SBS, or better yet, if you talk to people at SBS or wherever, to get the general media attention because that starts the community awareness or continues the community awareness, which really hits home. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another question, uh, how do we get public mental health to be more trauma informed? Yeah. So this is one of the things that um, was a recommendation of the, um, the right to be safe that the Mental Health Complaints Commissioner's report. Get, get hold of that report if you don't have it, and even if you read the executive summary. But it's, it's really two things. It's culture change, but it's also education. So there's some programs at the moment and there's a bit of more of a uh, grassroots 
attempt to try and teach the junior staff, nursing staff, allied health and medical staff about how to take a trauma history because that has to be done sensitively. And that's also where consumer voices and consumer teaching and peer workers are really important because you can educate what is a sensitive way to do this because you can't just jump in and take a trauma history. That will really be bad. So people have taken the line of, if I don't know how to do it, then I'll just not do it. So we challenge that to go, no, that's not good enough. So there are some education programs going on at that level, but there needs to be a lot more. And also if, if people um, can, I know it's really hard, but if people volunteer that story, that's important too, that the, the, the woman consumer or um, person with lived experience actually can don't have to give every detail because that's really tough but just to clarify that you know i've had some horrible things happen and i think some of my current problems relate to that is really important to get out there too thank you um i think we probably only got time for one more question um but quite a few have come through so what i'll do is i will take these down and send them on to you if that's all right Jashree, and then i will either email the uh, responses around to everybody um, so yeah, the final question for today, um, if bipolar disorder is first diagnosed in the perimenopausal period, what is the connection? Uh, this person feels that they, so they suffered from postnatal psychosis. Exactly. And Marina. always the way. And the Mirena, I mean, it's like if you stuff up a hormone balance in the, in the brain, you then create this environment for a change in the brain chemistry that is hormone triggered. So it's, it's, I'm, I'm making it really um, oversimplified, but then it's, it's, it's important to deal with that hormone trigger. And like the Mirena IUD is a trigger. The menopause process is where hormones go up and down and sideways. And so you need to then have a hormone treatment that smooths out that fluctuation. Otherwise, the mental state goes all over the place as well. And you can do this to anyone. You know, if you, if you give anyone weird doses of hormones, you will simulate various mental health symptoms, right? So that's the other thing to remember too, that we are at the mercy of some of our chemistry. We can control some stuff, but not everything. Mm, absolutely. So um, I think that's the other part about biology that's important to combine with psychosocial. People go, oh, I don't want to know about neuroscience. I don't like biology. You know, the medical faculty has done such bad things with drugs and so on. Yeah, sure. But the answer to the next step is also going to rely on better neuroscience um, and better connection with the environment. So it's putting all those factors together, like the early life trauma, with the brain chemistry, with the hormone stuff, come up with some trauma therapies and come up with a new approach that doesn't cause weight gain and all the rest of it. So this is one of the things that I think um, we have to be careful that we don't throw everything out because sometimes that, that does become an issue um, that people feel like, oh, you know, olanzapine made me fat. I don't want to have anything to do with it. You know, we've got to get past and get better. Yes, olanzapine did make people fat and it was terrible. And it is terrible. So we need to do better. And that's why um, I, I would encourage sensitive research that's actually integrated research, you know, so that things don't get just done in isolation. Great. Should I get off my soapbox now? <laughs> No, never, never. Um, thank you so much. I personally, um, that entire uh, webinar and the entire talk meant a lot to me. Um, and it was extremely informative and very inspiring. And I'm sure everybody felt exactly the same. Um, so thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, as I mentioned before, I will take down the rest of the questions because there's still quite a few questions left. Um, and I'll send them through to you if that's all right. And then email around the responses. I hope um, people, if I've raised things that are difficult for people, that you, you, you've got some support. Um, really important at this point in time that we all keep ourselves as mentally well as we can. So, you know, if you're, I always tell people, if you're an artist, 
please, please, please go and do something that's uh, that's you know cr- feeds your creativity. If you're a musician, if you're um, if you're not, you know, pick something up that gives you some half an hour of fun. We need Absolutely. at least half an hour of fun every day. So stay well, everybody. And you. Thank, thank you so you. much, and thank you to everyone that joined. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.